Okay, we well, you should be live on YouTube now. Um, I'll uh, wait until the top of the hour, I'll wait until four o'clock to get underway. I've had an indication on uh, the Discord chat that um, we're all live and everything's okay. If someone can give you a thumbs up in Discord in the questions lectures channel to let me know that you've got audio, that'd be great. Wonderful, thank you. Thanks, James, and thank you, Sarah, and thank you, ET. Um, we'll we'll kick off in about five minutes, right on four o'clock. <clears throat>
Okay, it's uh, four o'clock. We'll uh, kick off the lecture now. I'll just ask for one more confirmation that you've got the audio coming through okay. Just ask on, um, on Discord. Wonderful, thanks Liam. Wonderful, so uh, in today's lecture, uh, we have an hour, or up to an hour. Uh, I'm going to cover with you two, uh, two pieces of information and they are what you see on the title screen here. Uh, the slides I uploaded to Discord about half an hour ago, I also put them on um, Blackboard under the week one, week two rather course materials. So you have access to the, to the electronic version of the slides um, and we'll fix up errors and typos and such as we, um, as they're advised to us. Okay, so the two things I wanna cover with you today, um, extend and explain material that we saw uh, earlier on, on Monday's lecture. And so those two things are, are data types and arrays. And the reason I, uh, I want to, I say that they explain and extend is because we actually encountered both these concepts in Monday's lecture. And, uh, but what I want to do now is in isolation, look at each of these two, these two concepts. And so neither of these things will be brand new to you if you followed along with Monday's lecture. Um, and hopefully they'll explain aspects of the, of the behaviors that we saw and, and the things that we saw about the Python programming language in Mon on Monday's lecture. And so I'm structuring the today's lecture using the same format as I did on Monday. I've broken the content into two chunks. The first one is we look at variables and, and what are known as data types. Um, and then the second chunk, we look at the, um, um, things <laughs> uh, called arrays in Python. Uh, we've act and, we, and we saw them again on Monday's lecture. And in each of those two major chunks, I'm gonna break the content into both principles and then do a live demo. And so for each of the live demos that I do today, I'm gonna to show you examples of both variables and data types and also arrays. And I'm gonna do it only at the console. So unlike Monday's lecture, when I was running some program code, I'm going to do everything in an interactive fashion with you on the console today to, to illustrate um, the, the, the concepts in today's lecture. So let's start with variables and data types. Um, we've already seen in our very first lecture and on Monday's lecture again, we've looked at variables and um, we've typically used fairly short variable names, X, Y, T. When we start to write more complicated programs and in particular programs that need to be maintained over a period of time or programs that need to be um, shared with other, with other people, it really makes sense to take uh, some care with the structure of your of your of the code that you write. One really important way of structuring those ideas is by choosing variable names appropriately. And uh, there was a great question uh, that was asked on on, on Discord uh, in, in an earlier lecture about do we have to use single character variable names? And my answer to that question at the time, and it's repeated here, is absolutely not. Um, sometimes it is appropriate to use sim single character variable names, but often it makes sense to make the variable names descriptive so that if you come back to code that you wrote six months ago, you can understand what the idea is instead of just having, you know, some variable called X and you think is X the height of the, the ball? Is X um, the, the volume of water in a tank or the, or the depth of a tunnel I'm drilling? Um, and, and so I've given, I've put a green tick against some variable names that you might come across in code that you write, they're all, they're, they're um, probably on the long side of uh, variable names because the variable names is typically something you type multiple times over um, in, a, in a program. So you don't want to use variable names that are too long. On the other hand, so if you're using uh, code and you had water level, altitude of your UAV or tunnel depth, they're, they're descriptive um, variable names, uh, whereas W, A and T are not. On the other hand, there are limits you wouldn't use a variable name, I would suggest, called average annual battery voltage too long. Um, you've got to retype it uh, many times if, in, in your code. And it, so there's, there's a sweet spot somewhere there between um, 
between those those, those choices of variable names. Um, while we're on the choice of variable names, I might as well point out a couple of things that you, you may have noticed before or that may have you may have encountered but may not have thought about before. There are different ways of uh, presenting variable names and some some people like to choose particular styles of presenting their variable names. Um, the two popular styles have, have become known as camel case and snake case. Um, camel case because it refers to the up and down shape of a, of a camel's back. Um, and there's two variants on camel case, uh, things like iPhone and Mac OS, a lower camel case because they've got a, they, they, they use upper and lower case letters, but they start with lower case letters upper camel case letters for things like PlayStation and YouTube, they use um, they use uh, upper case letters to start each each word in the in the variable name. Um, that uh, my personal when I'm writing code, I tend to use lower camel case uh, as a way of separating the words that make up multi word variable names. Um, you'll also see in some places, including the textbook, they use variable names that are known as snake case, which is um, lowercase with variable with words in, in, in the variable names that are separated with underscores because you can't use space in a variable name because it, um, the Python interpreter doesn't like that. Uh, I'm not going to make a big deal of this. What, uh, uh, which variable format you choose is, is almost completely a matter of preference, style, taste, context. Uh, uh, up to you, what a great course, your first course in programming, find out what works best for you and um, experiment. So I'm not going to be, I'm certainly not going to be prescriptive about it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm alerting you to it. So that, that's variables. And that's all I'll say about choice of variables. Um, Well-written code is easy to read code is code that communicates ideas. That's what it's all about. To introduce a little terminology, we have seen this earlier, but I want to introduce the formal technology now. When we talk about assignment in, in Python, we, we are talking about the use of the equals symbol. So the, the Python expression x equals two means that the variable x is given the value of two or technically is assigned the value of two. Um, and that's what I mean by assignment. And that equal sign plays a different role to the one that you would have seen in school, um, which, which uh, which comes out most obviously in the second dot point that you see here, where I've written x equals x plus four. Namely, x is assigned the value of x plus four. Um, and from high school uh, arithmetic, that expression doesn't make any sense. x is equal to x plus four, that doesn't make any sense. Um, but in the Python programming language, it's not read as x equals x plus four, it's x is assigned the value of x plus four. So what actually happens in, inside the computer when you type x equals x plus four is that the right-hand side is evaluated. The valuer or the evaluer that has been assigned to the value variable x is increased by a value four. And then that value is overwritten on the old value of, on what was the old, the previous value of x. So it's really an update on the value of x. There are some abbreviations which are available in Python and I've indicated them there at the bottom of the slide. Personally, I don't find much use for them. Um, they're only short abbreviations and to some extent, I find them more confusing than, than the, um, and therefore uh, less informative than their, their unabbreviated forms, but you're welcome to use them. So if you ever see code x plus equals four, what that means is not x is equal to four or x is assigned a value of four, but it's a shorthand for x is incremented by four and then overwritten on the old value of x. And similar similar um, uh, terminology for the for the for the minus, the star, and the times to, to represent subtraction, multiplication, and and division. Personally, don't use those abbreviations. You're welcome to. Most importantly, the fact that I don't use them doesn't mean that I won't see them in other people's code. So I need to be aware of them. So do you. Let's talk about data types. I didn't want to introduce this material in the formal setting that I'm going to do it now. Well, it's not particularly formal, but uh, uh, the more formal setting because I wanted you to get your hands on some code and write some code and have it have have firsthand experience of what it is to write a, a short Python program before you considered 
what data types are available in the Python programming language. There are many of them. Uh, we are going to use three or four uh, data types. And uh, the three of those four are indicated on the slide here in the bold font and that you have already seen. I think it's fair to say that you saw them in the very first lecture of this course. They are respectively int, float and string. We will actually introduce one more data type that's going to be, um, we'll look at it next week. Um, I'll ask you to um, hold your suspense until Monday of next week. There's a very specific reason I want to hold off on that data type. It involves some um, conceptual material that I wanted to use, introduce in a separate in a separate lecture. But I do want you to think about what data types mean um, and why we might have need for different data types in a programming language such as Python. We're using this programming language, we will be using it to solve problems that are of importance to engineers. And so we need to represent data that comes in different formats. And the three primary um, data type formats that we'll use in Python are integers, floats, and strings. So integers are whole numbers, zero, one, two, three, and so on, but they can also represent negative um, integers such as minus 10. They can actually represent very large numbers um, and certainly much larger than the number that you see on the screen there is 452617. And there are good reasons for using integers. They count things, things that have, have got, you know, it's one sheep, two sheep, three sheep. Uh, you count them in, in whole number terms. And so you would use a variable that's of data type int to store that quantity. Um, floating point numbers are Python's terminology for real numbers. So they're numbers that have a fractional component. They can be positive or negative. They might be integers, integer valued, but they don't have to be. So for example, you'll notice on the, on the, on the right hand side of the dot point indicated float, I've got the number 2.0. So that's a floating point number that happens to be storing an integer. It's the, it's the integer two, but it's being stored in a variable of type float. So maybe it's a number that can be fractional or it could be integer. If it could be either, it needs to be a float in order to maintain the precision. I don't want to go into details now about where the terminology float comes from beyond the saying here, it refers to something called a floating point number. Um, and this is a very, a completely standardized way of representing real numbers in computers. And that's all you need to know um, for the moment. Uh, we may get to look at what's behind floating point numbers and numerical precision later in the course. For now, floats are reals. And we saw strings. The STR type is a string. So we, we, we saw those in, in, um, in the lab access exercises from last week and indeed for this week too. Um, there's a function built into Python uh, that returns the type of a variable. So if you're ever at Python at the, at the, command, at the, the uh, console and you think, I wonder what type this variable is, the function type will return that for you. Um, and so you'll see today, uh, you'll see a number of these blue rectangles in the lecture slides. They indicate places that I'm going to illustrate um, uh, concepts on the, on the console later, but I want to draw your attention to here. So if you look at this slide, you'll see that X is an integer, Y is a float, S is a string. And if we ask at the, at, the, at the console what the type of variable X is, it returns a, um, a, a message to us to say it's type int, or type Y is a float, or type S is a string. Um, and so Python is, even though the, the type may or may not, depending on context, it may or may not be of direct relevance to us as programmers, we're trying to solve an engineering problem. We probably not thinking too much about what type these variables are. Um, we can always find out the type should we, should we wish to know. Um, I've skipped over something there at the top of the slide that I, uh, I need to draw your attention to, although I'm not gonna make a big deal of. I've said the built-in function type returns the type of a variable. Strictly speaking, um, it returns the type of something called an object. Now, an object in software language has a very precise meaning 
and uh, there are entire modes of programming, ways of thinking about computer programming that, that for which um, objects play the primary role. Um, we are not going to emphasize objects in this course, even though Python itself supports objects and in fact is written around the concept of objects. I'm not going to make a big deal of it in this course. We don't need to know too much about the objects in order to solve problems that are of interest to, to engineers, most engineers, or at least the engineers in this course. That doesn't mean that objects are not important. Some of you may this semester or in a subsequent semester study the, the course Seng 11, uh, 1100 or it might be 1110, I think might be a typo, Seng 1110, um, which is an entire course, an entire first year course using a different programming language, Java, to uh, focus on a mode of programming that puts objects as the primary um, um, concept around which the entire problem solving um, enterprises is, is based. And that's that's right and proper for that course. It's not appropriate for this one. So I'm not going to make a big deal of what's called object oriented programming. I would argue that Python allows us to get most of the benefits of objects without worrying too much about the underlying technologies. They're interesting. They're just not relevant to us in this course by and large. Now, when we've got variables of different types in a, in a program, it may be necessary to convert from one type to another. And I've said there, if it makes sense, it doesn't always make sense. So for example, if we've got, if we've got numbers stored as integers and stored as floats, we can convert floats to integers and we can convert integers to floats. We can't easily convert a string to an integer. We might convert it to a, to a, to a, to a set of integers, each integer representing one character in the string, but that's a different thing. Type conversion refers to moving backwards and forwards between, between different types. So in this, uh, at the top of the screen here, you'll see in the first line on the console, x is equal to one, that defines x as an integer variable. The second statement, y equals float x, converts that or creates a variable y, which has got the same value as x, but is a float type. We can actually go back the other way too. We can take a floating point number and convert it to an integer. If you ever do that, you need to be very careful because converting a float to an integer will generally result in a loss of precision because integers aren't capable of representing the fractional part of a number. So any conversion between a float and an integer will result in a loss of precision, a loss of information stored in the fractional part, unless the number happens to be an integer. Okay, so type conversion can be done explicitly. We can, we can ask for it ourselves. Python can also do it behind the scenes. And, and this is where the, the one I'd probably draw your attention to because it can result in things uh, happening that you didn't explicitly ask for, but yeah, no, nonetheless it happened. So for example, if you have an integer x, which is in the first, in, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see an integer value x takes the value two. Somewhere in our code, we write x is equal to x plus four, 4.0 representing a floating point number. So if we add an integer to a float, the Python interpreter says, aha, I know what you mean. You're adding an integer to a floating point number. I'm gonna make the result a floating point number. So even though the original definition of X had, as, had X as an integer two, after the addition of 4.0, after the addition of the floating point number, the result is a float type. So that's where it's automatic type conversion. It's not something that as programmers we've done, it's happened automatically for us. So let's do a live demo now of, um, of some of those concepts that we've seen uh, using the console. So here we are at the console. Oh, would you believe? Console, there we are. I'm just gonna go back up through some of these examples that we looked at in, in lectures. Um, what's a good one to start with? X is equal to two. X is assigned the value of X plus four, means that X now takes the value of six. So the old value of X, which was two, has been overwritten by the value six. 
um, if I say x is equal to two again, and I say x plus equals four, and then I ask for x to be printed again, x plus equals is short for x is, uh, x plus equals four is short for x is equal to x plus four. X has currently got the value of two. We add four to it, we get the value of six. So there's, there's an abbreviation there that you see highlighted in blue. Again, not one that I personally use much of, but you definitely will see it. So it's important that you're aware of it. Um, the second thing we saw was the, was the type function. So let's start with x is equal to two, y is equal to 4.0. Notice what I'm doing here. The value of y is four. It's, it's an integer valued quantity. And yet, if we ask for what type float at y is, sorry, y equals four, and we ask what type y is, it tells us it's a float. I've, in fact, what I did there by saying y is equal to 4.0, I forced y to be of type float. There it is, it's type float. If I had simply typed the value four, which has got the same numerical value, but I didn't use the dot zero to indicate um, the presence of a decimal, or if y just y equals four, and then type, um, so if I just type y equals four, and then ask for the type of y, it's an integer. So this is something we're gonna see uh, later today and throughout the course, that the presence of a decimal, decimal point, or sometimes a point zero, um, indicates that the variable is a type of the type float, even if it happens to take a um, the, a, a round figure um, to take an integer value um, figure. So if we ask for the type, oops, ask for the type, we get float. And if we make a string, say s s equals hello, sorry. Is our string variable. We can ask what type it is and it returns string for us. So our fundamental building blocks for types are integers, floats, strings. We'll introduce a new type on Monday that'll really round out the types that we need to use in this course. Then we talked about type conversion. So we said x is equal to one. It's an integer if we want to check that x is an integer. Yes, it's an integer. Um, y equals float x. We can print the value of y. It's got the same numerical value as, as y, and yet the type of y is, is a float. The type of x is equal to the integer. So that's, a, that's an explicit type conversion. And we can go back the other way. Let's, this is the, the interesting one. Let's say y equals 3.6. If we say z is equal to an integer version of 3.6, sorry, integer value of y, this is going to be an explicit type conversion from a float to an integer. Who wants to take a guess at what the value of z is going to be if I print it? Something's going to happen. I've got a floating point number and I'm going to convert it to an integer. Looks like it chops off the fractional part. Okay. So there's a loss of precision. The real answer was 3.6. Converting it to an integer results in loss of precision. And the final version was the automatic type conversion where we start with x equals two. Let's type, let's, let's confirm that the type of x is an integer. Somewhere else in our code, we say x is equal to x plus let me, let's say 4.5. So we can do two things. We can print the value of X and it's 6.5, that's great. Which means that the type of X now must be a float. It was an integer. It's become a float through the automatic type conversion process.
Let's go back to, that was our live, our live demo. Good. Second major concept for today that I want to cover is uh, something known as an array. And in fact, we've already seen arrays um, that uh, they appeared in Monday's lecture. Remember the example we looked at, we looked at the height of the ball as it was, uh, and we, we, we looked, we computed the height of the ball above the, 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 the ground. And we did it for each millisecond for the first second of the flight of the ball. We stored the time in an array T and we stored the height of the ball above the ground in an array Y. And just to prompt your memory about our use of those arrays, we used a concept known as vectorization, where we defined T using the Lin space function. And then we computed the Y, the height of the, the ball above the ground, um, using an expression, a quadratic expression that, that used vectorization, a feature with Python, in order to compute the height at every point at every millisecond. So we have already seen arrays. Now, the arrays that we're going to use in this course are imported from the NumPy library. Um, there are arrays that are, or things that are very array-like that are available in the, in the native uh, Python language. But the ones in the NumPy library are more convenient for us. And for each of those NumPy arrays, all the array elements must be of the same type. So if you've got an array of integers, all the elements have to be integers. If you've got an array of floats, of real values, all of the values in that array have to be of, of, of type float. So the arrays that NumPy library provides are all of one type. Um, that's not the case for the, the standard um, array that's provided by, by Python, but actually it turns out that NumPy's implementation is numerically much more efficient or can be much more efficient. And so we're going to use them, um, I'll say exclusively. I, I, I don't think we have need to use the, the native form of the Python, the Python libraries, the Python arrays. So the, the, the mental model I want you to have in your mind when, you, when you're using arrays is that they're like a collection of boxes um, that, that are all um, labeled with an index. And the indexes, as we saw on Monday's lecture, the indexes are used to identify the individual array elements. And the indexes count from zero. So the, the, the first entry, the first box is, is labeled, labeled zero. The second box is labeled one. The third box is labeled two and so on, dot, dot, dot. Now, if you, um, if, and if you need to, um, you may not need to, depending on your course of study, if you need to know about how those um, boxes, to use some informal terminology, are really stored, they're really memory locations in computer memory. And um, the size of the memory locations depends on the underlying type of the array. Now, Python uses what's called zero-based indexing, which means, as I said, that, that the labels start from zero and they count upwards. There are four common ways of creating arrays. There's many ways of using them. We're just going to focus on creating them today. We're going to use them as we as um, as we move into next week and beyond. All I want to do today is show you how to create the arrays and, and how to do some basic operations on them. We'll use them to solve engineering problems from next week and beyond. So there are at least four common ways of creating arrays, and I've picked them out here directly from the textbook. We've already seen the linspace function. I'll recap that that function for you. Um, in, in the slides to come. But there are three other methods that I've indicated here, zeros, array, and copy. And what we do now between now and the end of the lecture is show you how to use those four ways of creating arrays and some basic operations on them. But the mental model I want you to start thinking of is that as an array is a collection of memory locations or a correct collection of boxes. Now, I want to get you to think about arrays as having um, really three aspects to them. There's the name of the array. There's the indexes, which are like the labels that are used to identify the contents of the array. And there's the, the 
contents of the, the array themselves. So while the labels or the indices are always integers because they're, they're counting how many, how many boxes, how many, how many um, computer memory locations are used, the integers, the, the labels, the indices are always integers. The contents of the array could be integers, could be floats, could be other types. Let's focus on integer and float. So this, what you see on the screen here now is a visual representation of the array that you saw in Monday's lecture. We saw this command, t equals np dot lin space 0, 1, 1001. Remember what the np prefix stands for? It stands for, it's short for NumPy, which again is the, the library that we're going to be using to um, import the arrays, to import the array type. And the 0, 1, 1001 terminology, it's not something I expect you to memorize. If you need to know what the format of the linspace function is, you can look it up. Weeks to come, I'll show you some great places to, to look it up for now. I just want you to focus on the specific example that we're looking at here. Linspace 0, 1, 1001 creates 1001 coordinates or 1001 elements. They're labeled zero up to a thousand, therefore there's a thousand and one of them. And they represent the numbers between zero and one, here are the limits, equally spaced or linearly spaced. So that's what the linspace function does. So T is the name of the array. The array indices or the, um, the, the indexes, indices are numbered zero, one, two, Python uses zero based indexing. And the array elements, if we ever want to access the individual elements, they're, in, they're accessed with these square brackets. So T0 refers to the number in the zeroth, um, is the zeroth element of the array. T1 refers to the first numbered element. It's the number 0 0.001 according to this recipe here. So that's the first way of creating an array. Is to, is to use the function linspace that comes from the NumPy library. And that's often one of the most common ways of, of creating an array. Um, and so what you see here uh, on, on page 12 is uh, importing the um, linspace function from the NumPy library. We then use the linspace function 0, 2, 3, which creates three numbers equally spaced between zero and two, namely the integers zero, one, and two. Now by default, the linspace function returns real valued numbers. And so you'll see here in lines three and four, that when we type in X, namely tell us to asking the Python interpreter at the console, tell us about X, it tells us that it's an array, great. And it also, returns the values of the, the array elements, zero, one, and two. And notice how that there's the, there's the, it's zero dot, one dot, two dot, or decimal, zero decimal, one decimal, two decimal. That indicates that the values of the, in the X array are real valued. And sure enough, if we go to line five in the console here, and we ask for what the type of um, X zero is, meaning what's the type of the, the number stored in the array element indexed by, by zero, the response is numpy.float64. Now that might look a little different from the float that you were expecting. That's because the type is being inherited from the, the float from the numpy library. Float64 is a particular float type that's supported by numpy64. The particulars of that float type don't matter. The fact is, the element itself, the array element to, uh, x0 is of type float or effectively of type float. The array itself also has a type. And if we, we ask for what type x is, remember x is the name of the entire array, it'll return something called array, And that's the data type that's been provided to us by through the NumPy library using um, 
been creation, created through the, the call to lead space. Again, I don't expect you to understand or, or, uh, or be concerned about the, the particular um, terminology numpy.nd array and numpy.float64. The fact is that the, the array itself has a type and the array elements have a type. The second way we can create a, an array uh, in, in Python is to use something called the zeros function. And uh, the, the call to in, in line two uh, that you see on the screen here now, x equals zeros three comma int, that's a way of asking Python, create me an array with three entries and I want those entries to all to be of type int. So the, the elements inside the, uh, inside the array it's, uh, are all of integer type. And if we ask for, for X to be displayed on the, on the console, we get a response that says array zero comma zero comma zero. Great, it's an array of zeros, that's worked. The absence of the decimals here implies that those values are, are integers. If we, wanted a, if we wanted an array of three elements that are, were a float type, we simply call y equals zeros three without this second argument. And the final thing I could draw your attention to down the bottom of the page is that there's a, a built-in function in Python called len, um, which is short for length. And that tells us the length of an array is how many elements it has, three in this case. So I think that tells us that what you see on slide 14 there is a reiteration of what I've just said um, uh, on the previous slide. I think I've said everything there, oh, except the first point, which is to say that if we create an array of integers or we create an array of floats, each of those is valid. An array of either type is valid. It's not possible to mix integers and floats in a single array at least not using NumPy. That is not a restriction. Um, if we ever need to store integer valued quantities in an array of floats, that's all right. We can use the, um, the integers themselves uh, with, a, with a zero fractional part um, in, in, in the array of floats. So it's not actually a, it's not actually a restriction um, and it's certainly not a restriction that we would need to worry about at this point. I said there were four ways that we could create arrays in, in, in Python. The first one was to use linspace. The second one was to use the zeros function to create a, um, an array of zeros. The third method is to, create, is to use a call to this array function. And um, that allows us to do two things in one line of code. It creates the array. What that means is it reserves memory locations to store the entries of the array. And it also puts values in those, in those, um, in those locations, depending on how we call the array. So this call to array 012 creates an array of three elements and it puts, instead of a, an array of zeros, it creates an array that's got the zeroth element as zero. The first element is one, the second element is two and they're integer types because we, we asked for them to be integer types because we didn't use a decimal. If we wanted an array of three real numbers, we'd have to use line four that you see here on the, on the, on the screen on page 15, where we, we call the array function, zero dot, zero decimal, one decimal, two decimal, that creates an array of real numbers. And this array function is not built into Python, but it's available inside the NumPy library. So our first line of that we that we need to execute at the console is to is to indicate to the interpreter that we're going to use the array function inside that's available inside the NumPy library. So that's the third way of creating um, of creating an array. Arrays have got um, the interesting feature that. Uh, if we create an, an array of three elements, x0, x1, and x2, I'll do this in, in the, on the console live with you in a few minutes, but I've taken a screenshot here. The first, uh, we, from, um, we import the, the array function from the NumPy library. We define an array 
In this case, the call array 11, 12, 13 creates an array with three elements. And the, the values of those elements are 11, 12, and 13. And they're indexed by 0, 1, and 2. Remember that Python always uses zero-based indexing. That means the index of the, the, the lowest index in an array is always zero. And then we count upwards from there. So that, so that if we have a three element array, whose values, whose elements are 11, 12, and 13, then x0 is one, x1 is 12, sorry, x0 is 11, x1 is 12, x2 is 13, x3 is not defined. We count from zero and there are three elements. They must be numbered, they must be uh, labeled. They must have indices zero, one, and two. So if we try and access the memory location or the, the, uh, the array location three, which is out of bounds, we get an error. That error is a good thing. And I've indicated that with a green tick here on page 16. The reason is that the Python interpreter is telling us the array is as a fixed size. If you try to access a memory location that's outside that fixed bound, those fixed bounds, you're trying to access a computer memory location that whose value do, has nothing to do with the value of the, the values in the, the array X. And so it generates an error. Uh, for those of you that uh, have written or will write programs in other languages such as C, the C computer programming language, if you tried to access memory location three would say, no problems, here's the value. And you'd get some random number from memory. Even worse, it would probably allow you to write into memory location three, which is outside the bounds of the, the, the well-defined array. If you want a bigger array, you can define it. But once you've defined an array, it's of a fixed size. And so sometimes you'll, you'll hear of um, uh, exploits that uh, programmers have, have, exp um, have tapped into to try and um, uh, create uh, malware that interferes with the operation of computers using um, malicious programs. One way in which they do it is to try and access memory locations that are out of bounds. Um, and, and thereby, thereby write values into locations that are um, perhaps sensitive or contain information unrelated to the, to the arrays that, that are really being worked with. So I see this as the out of bounds error as a good thing. You'd normally think errors as being something to be avoided. In this case, it's doing something really useful. Okay, one fourth method. I wanna show you, um, uh, mention it to you and then show you how to be very, that you need to be very careful um, about it. Um, uh, the first line of this code, this of, of the console here, y is equal to x. Um, uh, the, the assumption is that the x has continued on from this code here that you see on slide 15. So we're defining x as per page 15, and then we jump to page uh, 17. Statement y is equal to x, or y is assigned the value of x. Looks pretty reasonable. Um, we've got a, an array x that's got three elements. Uh, we then create a new array called y. And we take, to, for, for y, we simply create the values, that, take the values in x and copy them seemingly to the array y. And so if we display what the value of y is, um, it's as expected. If we then write a particular value into the zeroth entry element of the Y array, we, we're, the, the array starts off with the values zero, one, and two. This expression on line 12 of the console overwrites the zeroth element of the array in Y with the value 10. So if we, in lines 13 on the console, ask Python what the value of the Y array is, the value 10 has been overwritten on the zeroth element of the Y array. That's as expected, no problems there. The trouble is, or the, the, re the, the reason I've, I've said take care here, is that in overwriting the value of the Y array, the, the zeroth element of it, we've actually gone and changed the X array as well. Even though 
we didn't we didn't take any action on X, the X array is also changed. That is a huge uh, feature of the language. It's something to be very careful of. There's a reason here. I don't want to go into the details because I want to show you at the console um, the use of arrays, but I do want to draw your attention to it. I would avoid this direct copying of an array unless you really know what you're doing because you can create a copy, modify the copy, and the original two is changed. That's weird. That is officially what you are seeing there on the screen is officially the most unusual behavior of Python that we've yet seen in this course. Take care. I can't do that without showing you how to do it um, in, in the intended way. And so here it is on, on slide 18. Let's copy an array, but do it the right way. There's a function called copy inside the NumPy library. And so what the copy function does, if you see here in line 16, we create an array um, using the linspace function. So the array is just the, simply the entries 0, 1, and 2, a three-dimensional, a three, an array with three elements, an array of length three. Okay, good. Then that array is called x. If we want to, if we want a, a copy of the x, x array that we want to do some additional calculations with, if we call the NumPy library function copy, it actually does two things. It actually creates a new array, in this case called y, and then it fills the value of y with the values copied from the other array, namely x. So the copy function actually has two functions. It first creates a new array, not a copy of, not a, not a, not another label for the for the first array. And in this case, it actually creates a new array and then fills it with the values copied from the other array. So if we overwrite an element of the um, the y array, this 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 first value 10, it's okay. The original x is unchanged. So if you do want to copy an array, do not do what's the, the code that's shown on on page 17, but follow the method on page 18, which is to use the um, the copy function from the NumPy library. You may, I mean, it, it may be not something that you that you do very often, but it's certainly an unintended consequence um, of the of the of the language itself. So I do want to spend a few moments with you on the console, showing you the the array functions live. There's one last thing I want to be able to. Um, I want you to be able to do, or at least have seen before, so that when it comes to a chance to uh, actually um, use it to solve an engineering problem, you've seen it. It's a really common um, activity when we're solving engineering problems is that we're given an, um, an array uh, and we want to use, we want to extract a subset of, it, of its elements. What's a good example? Um, think about the array T that we defined to represent the time steps for the, the trajectory of the, the, the soccer ball on Monday's lecture. Maybe instead of looking at the first one second of flight, we want to look at just the first half second of flight. So we've got an array T, but not all of T is equally of interest. We don't care about the second half of the, of the flight after, after half a second. We're only interested in the first half a second of flight. So what we want to do is take an array and extract a subset of its elements. In Python terminology, that's called slicing the array. Slicing array is to take a subset of its elements. And the way that that's done in, in Python is to use this uh, colon operator. So if we have an array x, x square bracket i colon j, allows us to reference a subset of the of the indices for the array x and to create a new array from it. So what you see here on the on the screen on page 19 is a representation of a six element array x. A slice operation performed on that 
x to, to extract the subset consisting of the four yellow elements and then a y at the bottom which is created from extracting those uh, that that subset so you'll see there's something we need to be a little careful of um, personally i find it a little um it's a little it's potentially it's a little confusing so i draw your attention to it here I've got some notes on the on the next and final slide you'll see that the the, the i colon j in this case x one colon five actually extracts out the elements that are indicated by through the indices one two three and four now you might ask yourself why doesn't x one to five extract the elements of indices one two three four and five that's a good question um, we deal with the language as it's presented to us and uh, so i just draw your attention to it here so the way to think of it is if if you've got x start colon stop that'll extract the subset of the elements with indices start through to stop minus one. So the, the example you see at the, here on the bottom of this, of page 20, x one colon five means the subset of the elements of the array x indexed from the first element, which is start, which is the, the oneth, the first um, element of the array x up to stop. In this case, stop is five, so we, extract the elements uh, one through to five minus one is four x one two three and four and it's these values 12 13 14 15 here now that's a pretty quick run through i'd use this as a reference you'll get a chance to see it in lab act exercises where you can sit and at the console and scratch your head and think um and a couple of times until you work out how the index the, the indexing works for slicing um but i i, I draw it to your attention I can guarantee you'll need to use a slice um, in the course, and I just wanted to draw your attention to it. So that is the rudiments of, uh, of arrays. And what I wanna do now with you is work through a few of those live in the five or thereabouts minutes that, that remain. Let me... to the console and let's go back and look at a few of the things that we did in this second half of the lecture we um from from numpy we i want to import the lin space function and then This code we saw. Let me. Let me do this. Okay. Uh, why has that not worked? There we go. Okay, so now we've defined our first array and we can look at the length of the array. This is what we didn't, we didn't do this the other day. The array uh, T has got 1001 elements in it. And if we want to index the, the, the specific entries, we can use the square bracket notation. That's the, the lowest element, the next highest element, the second, the next highest element, the next highest element, the final element in the array is is a thousand, and if we try and access beyond the end of the array, what's going to happen? What's going to happen if we try and access beyond the end of the array? The arrays are elements are are indexed from zero up to a thousand. If we try and access number a thousand and one, we get an error. In fact, the error is quite informative index 1001 is out of bounds so that's telling us we're, we're we're trying to access memory that's beyond what we're we're able to we're able to do um let's 
skip that one. Let's look at the next example we looked at in lectures. We import the zeros function and then we ask for Python to create an array of zeros of type integer. So now if we look at, we ask for X, it tells us it's an array with three entries and we can infer that the, the data type is integer by looking at the by looking at this expression and seeing that the, the array elements don't have a decimal after them, it's implied that they're, they're integer valued. But if we, we can actually ask for what the type of the, the zeroth entry of the X array is, and it'll tell us it's a, a particular type of integer. You can, you can look at that message and say, it's got something to do with integers. It's, um, it's NumPy's version of um, a particular type of integer. So that's good. Remember, because we're using the NumPy version of arrays, not the not the built-in form of the arrays. If we wanted to create uh, an array of floats, we could just ask for a, 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 an, an array in, of this form. There it is. It's got three entries, zero decimal, zero decimal, zero decimal. And uh, we could ask for what the type of X zero is in this. Now it's a float 64. Again, it's a float type rather than integer type. Um, the third way of creating an array was to use the array function. We can now call the array function and instead of creating an array of zeros, Actually, let me do something a bit more. There's an array, it's got, it's got length three. What's the zeroth entry of the, of the array X? What's it going to be? It's 11. If we ask what the array is, it's got elements 11, 12 and 13. Great. We can also create an array of floats if we wanted. We do that by putting a decimal here, decimal here, decimal here. Good. And now we can type what's x zero. It's 11.0. We can ask for the type of, of that and it's a, it's a float type. Good. Um, we've seen that. We're pressed for time rather than race through copying or slicing. I'll leave, I'll leave it at that point rather than race it and get it wrong. Um, you've seen that you've got enough in the, in the lecture notes to be able to replicate um, what you see there. So let me just, so we're, again, we're pressed, for, we're pressed right up against the hour. So I'm gonna wrap it up at that point. Um, and thank you for your attendance. You've, you've learnt two really uh, in, important uh, chunks of material to do with the Python programming language today. Data types, which will uh, be present, whether we care about them deeply or not, they'll be present from here till the, rest, the end of the course. And arrays, um, we'll have more to say about um, extended forms of these arrays in, 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 in several weeks time. But certainly the arrays that we've seen here today allow us to solve interesting um, engineering problems and we'll get into that next on um, Monday morning. Until then, I'll say bye for now. Thank you.